Okay. Are you ready to do this? I am. All right, all right, so here we go. So five, four, three, two, and one. All right, guys, welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. Guy McPherson here, and I am very excited to have my guest today, Tracy Morgan. Tracy, welcome. Hi, hi. Happy right. to be here. <laughs> Thank you. So Tracy is an occupational therapist with 15 years of experience practicing practicing for the last 10 in early intervention in psychosis in the UK Midlands. Tracy's experienced fairly significant trauma herself. Now she works with young people experiencing first episode psychosis, and she found that after the neurological psychosis symptoms are, are in remission, uh, she's left with residual trauma voices, quote unquote, with which she uses uh, in the in the subsequent treatment, and we'll get to that. Um, now, Tracy, I'm really excited you're on because, you know, early psychosis has been one of my interests and specializations. And yep. actually, you're the first person that I've brought on specifically who focuses on that. Oh. And we know that there's a lot of uh, uh, correlation with trauma, um, but we'll we'll dive into that anyway. So. Thank you again for, for being here. Uh, share with the listeners where you're from and where you're calling from. And we'll dive in. Right. Well, I'm based in the UK, obviously. Um, and I'm in the Midlands, which is very close to Birmingham, sort of Nottingham, Leicester area. I'm sort of in Warwickshire, where Shakespeare's from. Um, I'm originally from Scotland. That's why I've got a strange accent. Um, but I've lived here for 27 years. Yes, 27 awesome. years. So, awesome. yes, yeah, so that's where I'm at at the moment. So, given the fact that, I mean, I want, I want to address this because it, it's front and center here. Given the fact that we're in the, 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 the heart of COVID-19 that's going on here, how is that impacting you and your area? Uh, we're, uh, it's, it's absolutely, uh, mental health services have had to reconfigure everything that they're doing. Um, I'm currently off sick from work, not because of COVID, um, for a whole other reason. Um, But I was actually in a team meeting yesterday and um, everything's been reconfigured and it's been reconfigured on a daily basis. Um, We're trying to minimize um, face-to-face treatment with people unless it's an absolute emergency. Um, And, you know, we're doing everything, we're being really let's use this sort of thing let's use microsoft teams let's use skype let's use whatsapp and i'm thrilled about that because i've been trying to do it for the last 10 years mm-hmm. um so we're getting more in- innovative as as time goes on my concern is that first of all i think we're going to reduce the the feeling of illness of those who have had very severe anxiety mm-hmm. because the whole world suddenly is in the same boat. I don't know whether that's going to make us as a society more oh, um, compassionate towards that. Um, but unfortunately, I've got a lot of people saying to me, I'm so anxious, I'm, I'm relapsing, I'm becoming unwell. And it's like, no, 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 no. You're the same. Mm-hmm. You're the same. This is an illness. This is a worldwide feeling of we don't know what's happening. Mm-hmm. We don't know what's going to happen. And that uncertainty makes everyone anxious. So it's mm-hmm. a normalization of that. But obviously, this is going to be a massive, huge amount of trauma for everyone because the loss, we're going to have loss. Right, right. Yeah, that's a really good point about the, the, uh, the mental health aspect globally and yeah. how that's what that's going to look like for for those of us who have mental health challenges um you know will people it is an opportunity certainly for many people to be compassionate about those of us who are experiencing mental health challenges absolutely so yeah. go ahead i'm sorry yeah the really interesting thing is that with staff and I mean, at the moment, I've actually put on the the UK healthcare um, Facebook page, I actually put out a call saying I'm currently away from my workplace because of another illness. Um, If anybody needs to talk that's working in healthcare that just needs to vent, I've actually put myself out there and people are contacting me. And it's just the the most basic things that people Mm. were not very good 
at containing anxiety and it's those little hints and tricks and things that we teach our patients how to manage right. their anxiety and their emotions suddenly it's like we're teaching everybody that which is yeah. it's an amazing opportunity but it's everybody kind of needs it yeah, <laughs> at the same yeah. time yeah so how did you get into uh this this topic of early psychosis i actually accidentally came into it because um, i was redeployed from inpatients um i was the occupational therapist at an inpatient unit i was the only occupational therapist and they were closing um, that unit down and functionalizing and they were basically centralizing mental health inpatient beds um, and I had choices of where I was being redeployed to. I was very, very blessed um, 10 years ago for that to have happened. And I chose, I, I didn't think I wanted to do it, but I chose to go and work in early intervention and psychosis. I thought I would hate it, <laughs> but actually I'm still there and it's 10 mm -hmm. years later <laughs> and it's amazing how how much you grow with the the research because it's very cutting edge even here it's yeah. it's you know we're right on the edge of what's being discovered so let's let's kind of start with you kind of giving us a, a giving our listeners a snapshot of what an occupational therapist is because before i you know i'd been working in a clinic for five years where we had a multidisciplinary team and there were occupational therapists before i got there i didn't know what the heck they were they did and really came to appreciate and value and really respect the the not only the job you folks do but how vital it is for that population of yes. people who are experiencing those symptoms so what does an occupational therapist do right oh, i think the best <laughs> way to do everything superheroes no we're not um <laughs> I, I have been known to say in a team meeting when a consultant has said tracy can you do this patient i'll say you do realize i'm not jesus i have said that um not that <laughs> it's it's one of those jokes that i um what i tend to do in the in the role that i have now is that i will i take a lead on vocation I take a lead on getting people back to the workplace as quickly as possible and um, negotiating using employment law and um, to make sure that they're going back to a supported environment to actually make sure that their employers don't try and use um, constructive dismissal. Um, and, and, and we're getting great results from that. Most people are going back into the workplace, into their original workplaces, which is fantastic. Um, also educational settings making sure that because because our age range is between 14 and sort of 35 and to retirement age but i tend to sort of stick with the working age and to get them into education make sure they're supported in further education universities and it's very much what can we do to adapt the real environments that these people are working in i use sensory approaches um uh I'm really big on sensory, basically putting sensory, sensory adaptations to a very normal environment. So I've had a young man who was behaving so bizarrely. He had um, first episode psychosis and he was, his behavior was horrific. And Friday night, five past five, he would be up in A&E because he knew I wasn't around to catch it. He'd get himself admitted to the hospitals, they would rapidly tranquilize them, they were constantly restraining him. And I remember one Monday morning after I'd been on a course in Cardiff on sensory integration and I went, oh, he's seeking containment with deep pressure. So we basically put dark curtains in his rooms. We gave him heavy, well, he bought a heavy duvet, like an mm -hmm. eiderdown, really mm -hmm. heavy we started getting them to wear boxing compression vests you know for, that sports people wear and he started to feel contained and the mm -hmm. deep pressure it's things like that it's finding those ways around mm -hmm. a normal environment to make it easier to reduce anxiety and stress and to make things easier so that people can do what they value and what they have to do to have right. quality of life and that is that is such a a crucial element really for for anyone i mean oftentimes when we're talking about trauma and ptsd in veterans you know, there's yeah. a lot of talk about getting them back 
um, uh, finding a purpose, right? Getting them back to what they've been doing. Because yeah. a lot of times with people who've been uh, experiencing early psychosis, even first episode, there's a lot of shame. There's a lot of trauma. There's a lot of uh, feelings of inadequacy because oftentimes you have to, you're isolating yourself because you're so yeah. freaked out. You don't want to go out and being able to get back, just as you're saying, being able to get back to work and to be, and to go to school is crucial. And yeah. you see the people like, Oh my God, I'm back. I'm normal again. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And it's, it's, it is, it's phenomenal watching. And some people, it's a case of, they, they started off with no occupational structure. So somebody who was in the room, they were a bit of a shut in, they only played on their computer. And then it's like, suddenly they're faced with someone like me. And it's like, what do you want to be? And they go, mm. and then that, and some, that's when I go back and I do a bit of digging around and find out where mm. they were at before. What did you want to be? What are you into? What do you like doing? Why do you like computer games? Why do you like that kind of computer games? And then we start to build a picture and then we find a hook, what I call a hook. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I find that hook. I mean, one, one of my young lads, um, his, uh, we have care coordination in the UK um, where you look after somebody and you look after everything. From <laughs> social stuff to finances to education to work to family work, all of it. But I was called in by the care coordinator, um, and she said, "I don't get him. I don't understand this lad. I don't. I don't get it. I don't get him. I just don't get it." And she says, "Can you?" She said, "You're the geek whisperer." And I went, "Really?" <laughs> <laughs> and I went out, and this young guy um, was into writing narrative. And drawing. Now where it ended up with a bit of work and a bit of work on his um, anxiety and his social anxiety. I first of all I took him to Forbid Forbidden Planet. I don't know if you have that in the States. Um, it's a bit like a mecca of comic books and geek memorabilia. Basically it's a comic book store and I took him there and I said I'm going to introduce you but back to your people. This is your tribe and he wow. was like the different and then he, we, we took him down to the, I took him down to the college, we got him signed up and he did a course for three years in computer games design and mm. uh, he was looking at opening a business oh my and God. that young man never relapsed and he wow. was considered, he's going to be on Clauserill, that's what we thought, this is it. He's, right. But look at you, you can, so. I can just tell, look at your warmth is exuding. Seriously, out of there, and you know, one of the, my one of my colleagues was very similar to you. Just this really warm person who was able to connect with people, and a lot of times, like therapists, right? People who've like gone to school for therapy. There's a different way that that they approach things, and I myself yeah. fell into that trap. And yeah. you have that just natural warmth and ability to connect with people that is, is joyful and you. just, you're welcome. And just, I can just hear the way and see the way you're talking about this particular guy. And it's like, I can feel it. And it's like, right. Yeah. He was, this was a guy who was going to be on these crazy drugs and granted yeah. they serve a purpose Brilliant. for certain people. Right. Fabulous. But for not everyone. Right. Yeah. Um, let me ask you a question. Do you w currently, are you working on a multi multidisciplinary team with, with psychologists and therapists or you are? Okay. Yeah. Um, our team now we have um, CPNs, which is community psychiatric nurses. So that's nurses. So we've got nursing staff. We've got a social worker who's embedded within our team. Okay. We have myself, our occupational therapist. There is another occupational therapist, but she's our deputy manager and she doesn't, she, she's like, leave that to Tracy. <laughs> Just mm -hmm. please leave that to Tracy. Um, we also have support workers and we have a CBTP therapist, that's cognitive behavioral therapist for psychosis. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a psychologist as well. I'm trying to think if we've got anybody else. And we have nurse prescribers. All of us, except the psychologists, all of us care coordinate. So we all 
have a role with a group of patients, 15 usually. I have a slightly reduced caseload because of my other responsibilities. And we look after everything. So, but I tend to pick, it sounds awful, the ones with the highest occupational needs end mm -hmm. up with me. And we swap them around a little bit if required. But yeah, you have a central worker, but then you can have an occupational therapist. You've got psychologists coming in. And we are very much bound by the NCAP in the UK. We have to um, make sure that somebody's offered Clozaril at the right time if they need it. We have to make sure they're offered cognitive behavioural therapy for psychosis within three years. And we've got a lot of standards in the UK that we have to abide by. And vocational, occupational therapy and vocational work is my res one of my responsibilities to make sure okay. that everybody has that. So, so you, you have, uh, you know, a, a lot of experience under your belt. What would you say to, to the newer therapists out there who maybe aren't even familiar with this part? I mean, a lot of people aren't familiar with early psychosis. As you said, this is a cutting edge kind of uh, specialization topic right now. Um, you know, people are, we're learning more and more about it, but a lot of people aren't familiar with the early signs, the early symptoms, but what would you say to newer therapists uh, that maybe, you know, you might be working with? Okay. This is what I do say. <laughs> this is what I say to our students and new staff. Don't be scared of the jargon. I've been working in this for 10 years. My manager, uh, she's 11 years in psychosis early intervention. We have very, very well oiled wheels of process. Um, do not think for a minute that you are going to know all of this in the first month. In fact, if I came into work and it's not a school day and I'm not learning something, it's time for me to retire. So mm -hmm. it's like everything's a constant, you're constantly learning. And sometimes, especially with psychosis, and this is, this is how I describe it to my students and new people. Just when you think you've got what psychosis is and you go to grab it and think, I've got it, I understand, it disappears like smoke. It's, it just goes. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's because there is so much crossover between emotionally unstable or borderline personality disorder as we depending on ICD-10 or DSM and um, there's also huge overlaps with histrionic you've got loads of schizotypal um, and you've got schizotypal is one of our at-risk mental states if you've got a schizotypal diagnosis and then you get a drop in function you will then come under our team because you're considered mm -hmm. an at-risk mental state because you can go into full psychosis but yet and it's getting hold of all those things. And it's like, don't feel that you have to know everything about psychosis. Listen, learn. Don't be scared to say, what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what was that? It took me such a long time to work out the difference between positive and negative symptoms. And it's mm -hmm. one of the most basic, basic parts of it. And mm -hmm. we've got ways of teaching that. So a positive symptom is things that are added. So positive addition things that are added to normal experience. So voices, delusions, bizarre beliefs, tactile hallucinations, hallucinations generally. Whereas negative symptoms are things that are taken away or subtracted from our normal experience. So motivation, wanting to go out in the world, appetite, sex drive, all of that. And it's like working out. It's that very basic, but never as a new person coming into it, it's like, don't feel you have to know it all because you don't. You just need to believe that these people can get better and they can. Yeah. I've got young people that I treated seven years ago who have been married, had children, gone to university, done a master's degree, aren't on medication. They are living a full and wonderful life. And right. it's like, seriously. It's exciting to see, yeah, people yeah. do get better. And we would also, I would often tell my clients that it, and it's not going to be a straight line up, you know, yeah. oftentimes it's up, you know, but yeah. if they came and they did the work and they were committed to the program and the groups, et cetera, people, most, if not all people definitely got better. You yeah. know, when I, when I first started in, in that field, in that job, I, um, 
was kind of fresh out of school, newly minted with my degree. And I felt like I needed to have all the answers, right? I felt that, you know, therapy was going to do it. And it really, I kind of needed the rug pulled out from under me and to really get what you're talking about and, and kind of what's emanating from you, which is this warmth and this, the power of, you know, belonging and relationship. Talk a little bit about that and really your personal story getting that. Cause when you got into this field, were you like this, this, ah, the way you are? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah um, it was actually my, my, my husband now ex-husband who's an occupational therapist he he had not long qualified and I was working in an OT department in physical and physical medicine and he sort of went you have that thing you have this thing I had no idea what he was on about I still to a certain degree don't um but he said you need a rubber stamp you need to go and get a qualification so that you mm. rubber stamp what you can do for people because nobody will let you do it otherwise. Mm-hmm. Um, so I did. Um, I did my psychology degree part time while my babies were little, who are now 20, in their 20s. Um, and I did that. And then I did my occupational therapy degree because all I wanted to do was treat people. I just wanted to be a person that dealt with people with mental health problems. And that was the cheapest way for me to do it because I couldn't afford to do my PhD or my clinical doctorate. So that's what I did. And that's why I'm an occupational therapist. <laughs> but yeah, um, I've always had that. And it's strange actually because um, a very, very close friend of mine actually said to me, about, I actually thought the way you are with people was because of your training. And he said, I don't think it is, is it? And I went, mm-hmm. maybe not. He says, you've always mm-hmm. been like that. And I was mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. Okay, maybe, yeah. Mm-hmm. But it's that, it's really, Tracy, it's, it's that quality that I think so many, I don't, not every, but a lot of therapists suppress, you know, because they think that it's this other, all the techniques and the interventions that are so vitally important that are going to do the trick. And yes, those have their value, but it's being able to, I mean, you can just see you're just so genuine and authentic and being able to translate that when you're sitting in front of someone who potentially could be scary, who, you know, could be psychotic or experiencing certain symptoms. That's not easy to do, you know, to be able to be present with someone who's experiencing those symptoms. Yeah. At the end of the day, nobody really wants to hurt anyone. And I, I believe this in my absolute core. Fear is a response to anxiety. Um, and anger is a response to fear. And if you're getting anger, it's because somebody's frightened. And if we can actually just engage a softer tone of voice, step back, give them space. And it's all that polyvagal all that mm-hmm. polyvagal stuff that we talk about, which is amazing. And I, I don't have all the terminology. I know I do it, but I'm like, oh, I do that. I do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's clever. Um, but it's amazing because that's neurological. And it's like, as long as you can sit with somebody and sit in, I mean, and this, it's one of the things that you actually ask on the list of questions. It's like a go-to quote. And I don't know where this quote came from, but it's like sometimes when you're in the darkness, you don't want somebody to rescue you from the darkness. You just want somebody who's going to be okay to sit in it with you Mm. and to just hear you. And that's sometimes all we can do because I can't make it better, Mm -hmm. but I can certainly sit there so they're not on their own. Mm. And then it's like there's hope. Now that you're ready to listen, now that you can hear me, let's let's talk about the hope let's talk about other people that have come through this you know when you first started did you get that i think so it was probably you're you're one of those people who got it right away (laughs) i don't think i was as oh it's difficult i'm i seem to go the the other way the other way it, it 
it's almost like sometimes I doubt myself now because I don't have a master's degree in cognitive behavioral therapy because I haven't um, got my master's degree in, in, in sensory integration and it's like I don't need them I mm. just need those tools I need the mm. tools and I need the understanding and mm. I need to know when I can and when I can't that I think is the the bit it's knowing when and when not to do something mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um but generally what I tend to do is it's like it's it, when I've got somebody in front of me it seems so obvious I had we have a community in the UK that are travelers um and they, they travel around and they don't live in houses they live in caravans and on sites and they they tend to get a bit a very bad bit reputation um and they, they can be quite difficult to deal with they have a very different culture and a lot of them aren't educated they don't read they don't speak they're pulled out of school when they're about nine um and we have quite a lot of these young people that become psychotic and very difficult to manage um and i've actually got one who's an ot client of mine I, I don't care coordinate them and I remember doing the OT assessment and I went through so what do you like doing and, and you know what, what things do you do around the house and what things do you do around the site and I built a picture and when I fed back to him I said he he is so clever he is so so smart so smart he watches documentaries on Netflix and he, he gets frustrated because when he wants to watch one that isn't in English, he has to put the subtitles up and he can't read them. So he's constantly waking his girlfriend up who luckily can read a little. Mm -hmm. So basically one of my main objectives when I go back to work, um, hopefully soon, will be that actually I can't get anybody to teach this lad to read. So I've actually found a whole load of resources and I'm going to mm. do it. Wow. just little bits and then teach his girlfriend how to teach him and it's and and you've got an in because he's oh he's crazy smart he's crazy mm -hmm. smart and it's mm -hmm. like all you're lacking is to be able to read right right <laughs> you know well, look, and you you are a breath of fresh air man you're you're just so uh, 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 your 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 joy and your passion for this work is just so infectious and i just love talking to you thank you sincerely um, how about as we wind down here, how about a go-to book recommendation, whether OT related or trauma related or early psychosis related or not? Right. This is actually by a lady. I don't know if you'll have heard of her in the States, but I recommend everybody, anybody interested in trauma must read this woman. She's got a podcast. She is phenomenal. Oh. Her name is Carolyn Spring and it's Carolyn, oh. Carolyn Spring. Okay. And she she has a, a couple of books. You can get them on Amazon. You can even get them as audio books. The first one that I read was called Unshame. Um, and she's got she's got several others. They'll come up on Amazon. And the other one is called Recovery is My Best Revenge. Um, she is an absolute inspiration. And as she's 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 from the uk we don't have a lot i mean we've got you over there in the states which is amazing and i listen to you and a lot of my colleagues are starting to too but actually to get somebody who's british right. rare very very rare and she oh. is amazing she actually had a diagnosis of did disassociated identity disorder secondary to um lots and lots of uh, abuse in childhood um and she has recovered she has recovered and she is a leading light in this country um, and she is phenomenal, phenomenal, very, very British, very, very matter of fact. Uh -huh, I love uh -huh. it. I love her. She is really good. She has a podcast too. Um, a lot of the, the we have an a, a agency here called Rosa, which is um, to do with rape and sexual assault. It's, a, it's charity based um, and they have an amazing program and everything they do is based on her work. Wow. And to awesome. be honest, to be honest, I'm quite jealous of being in the NHS that their stuff is better mm. than what we can do. Because we're so bound by right. bound by all these, um, you must have this qualification and these letters after your name, and and it's like I've got the letters after my name. Can you just let me treat my patients, please? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, it's phenomenal, phenomenal work. So she is awesome. amazing. I'll definitely check her out. Well, look, I would love to have you back at some point. 
Um, I just really love talking to you and love to have your energy infuse this podcast. So, okay, um, no problem. Tracy, awesome speaking speaking to you, and thanks again so for coming on here. Thank you for letting me come on. All right, take Thank care. You. Okay, bye.